locust plague of chapter 1 is a warning that the nation would soon experience a day of the Lord. On page 66 in Chisholm, he tries to, to talk through this a little bit. But when he's talking about the theology there and that summary, um, the very, let me see, the second sentence he says there, the locust invasion was a warning that the nation would soon experience the judgment of the day of the Lord. What's so funny? Oh, you see it. It's right there. Yeah, it's right there. <laughs> Lifted it right out of the book and made that a question there. So this is back towards the end of the chapter in the theology section where he brings out that summary. Earlier in the chapter, he talks about a number of issues surrounding that. And then one of the interesting aspects of Joel is it does not specify the sins of God's people. And so you have all this cataclysmic you know, language taking place and specific judgment, <clears throat> but really not a reference to where the people are in sin. And then what makes this even more difficult is actually the dating of the book of Joel, right? So it's one thing to say, well, we don't know exactly what the sins are. Let's go back to the context and see. And then you realize, wow, this is a difficult one for us. And so the dating of the book is clearly post-exilic and the definitive viewpoint of the majority of scholars, well, that would be false. Um, there are a number of viewpoints. Um, Chisholm does at the beginning of the chapter set forth a post-exilic possibility, but then he spends a lot of time unpacking the reasons for and reasons against a pre, I mean, an early pre-exilic date and a later pre-exilic date. But where does the book of Joel fit? Um, do you have your worksheets out? Well, if you don't, get them out. Let's look at number four in your worksheets. Is, is question number four where you try to find clues in the book? Let's just use this as a springboard to talk about what you might have found. Now, this is a very difficult question for some of you, so please do not lose sleep over it. But what I'm trying to get you to do as you read through the book of Joel or the various books that we're studying is to think about what would be clues? What, what kind of clues are found in this book that might help understand where it actually fits in Israel's history? So let's just think about what you found in the book of Joel. Maybe you found nothing and maybe you found a few things. Yes? Well, the only thing that I really found was that there was definitely this giant army coming to, um, to basically extract or uh, check God's judgment on them. And, uh, and I believe that the way I interpreted it when I read it was that um, later on when he's mentioning Israel as opposed to Judah, I was picturing the nation of Israel. So I was thinking it was very, I was thinking along the lines of what Chisholm said was uh, the plague creates a plague. Okay. So you saw the coming army. Okay. What do you mean by the king's era? One uh, more like time. The second kings, like where he, what he was saying, like taking place along the lines of in second kings. So we've got, if we, you know, when he used the word great army, so there's some kind of event that's out here is what you're saying, right? So where in Israel's history could you then come up with times when a great army, a great leader came in and brought judgment to them. Well, there would be obviously significant times, the fall of Judah, the fall of Jerusalem, and things like that. And that's what you have to begin to think about. So you have to look for other clues as well. And so you felt like, um, and so what was the reference you were making to the, the later pre-exilic? Um, was there a clue you found in Joel? Not so much in Joel. Uh, I mean, I, I felt like because I knew that there were only so many times right, that okay. specifically they got taken over, and because they, he, Joel would mention Israel, I was picturing the Assyrian Empire because the Assyrian Empire is what took over Israel as opposed to Judah. And um, then also, uh, what was the other? Uh, but you, one other thing well, you I took did. some of the clues you were finding in the book and you started thinking further about it. Yeah, and okay, then the, yeah. the other one was an army from the north. Okay, so then you've got to, you know, decide where the nation is. You know, you've got the Mediterranean Sea here and what nations are this way, that way. And all of a sudden you're going, okay, somewhere up here 
this is going to be a problem. It made me think that it was affecting the northern kingdom. Uh, so, again. Yeah, so, again. so where is Assyria? Where is Babylon? And all of a sudden you can begin thinking through some of this. Jeff? Yeah, when I was reading through it, and uh, you know, Chisholm says that the locusts in chapter 1 are real locusts, but in verse 6 it says, For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number, its teeth is the teeth of a lion. And I remember that uh, Babylon's simple guy was a lion with wings. And so, I don't know, I thought that maybe that could be a reference, a metaphorical reference. Okay, so a lot of discussion is put on chapter 2. Is this a locust or a great army? But still you got this whole issue with chapter 1 as well, which seems much more locust, but, but could it be something more? So maybe there was another great army. I mean, Joel's a tough book to think through some of this. Yes? Okay, so what verse are you in? Uh, chapter 3, verse... Um, in verse 6. Yes, chapter 3, verse 6. And, and sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks. Or what, what, do, what do your Bibles translate that as? Some say Greeks, some say Grecians. Anyone else? Okay. And so that struck you. Well, the Greeks weren't really a unified uh, group, and they, they weren't really anywhere near as prominent as they were until after the exile, because uh, between the ex the, the four and then after the exile, that's how the uh, Peloponnesian Wars happened in that time period, which is when Greece really started to um, become a, a problem for that region. Yeah. With, with the Persians coming in and then having to invade up. It just seems strange to have. Uh, Yeah, and, and that's also a difficult phrase to even translate. But chapter 3, verse 6 obviously plays into this somewhere. Okay, you know, wh when does the Grecian Empire get raised up? And, you know, at what time would there be actually understanding of this? And so that would be something. Anyone else? Any clues you found? 114 makes mention of the temple, which means before 586 BC or after 515, depending on which temple they're talking about. Okay, so in, in 114, to the house of the Lord your God. Okay, now say that one more time. So it's, it's either before 586 B.C. Okay. Before the first temple is destroyed or after 515, which is when the second temple is completed. So in 586 B.C., when the Babylonians come in, they destroy. Okay, they just tear down. It's just utter destruction. And then we have the time period of the exile in here. And then it's, it's after this when Ezra and Nehemiah come along that we actually have the temple rebuilt. And most people would put that at 515 B.C., somewhere in there where the temple is rebuilt. So you've got this time period here where there is no temple. And so that's where, that's where you really get to the, the meat of how you date the book of Joel. In, in this verse, if you've got a temple, it's got to be before this. Or it's got to be after this time period. So that's, you know, sometimes when you think, well, man, well, I mean, why can't they come up with more precision than it's either pre-exilic or it's either post-exilic. I mean, why can't they just squeeze it down a little bit? It's because of clues like this in the book. And so you may have read over the house of the Lord your God and not even thought twice about it. Um, but when you're trying to look for clues, these are the kind of things that are going to stand out. So we've got this reference to the Greeks, we've got this great army, you know, so where would be the times in Israel's history where, where this could be? Well, if you've got this right here coming up, you know the Babylonians are going to come in, so maybe this is looking forward to this day right here, so we're somewhere over here. When you get over here, they would have other things that they would raise as issues, but that's why people would start sliding back this way or maybe go that way would be because of the temple and some of the issues that are there. So that can be a tough one, but I just thought it would be fun to see what you might have come up with in, in looking at some of your clues. And then number five, um, if the locusts of chapter two are not literal, then what do they represent? The invasion of an army. And so Chisholm talks about that a little bit, this great army that's going to come. And, and, and on page 57 and 58, 
is where he's dealing with that in this particular book. He asks the question, um, first one is, what is the relationship of the army described in 2, 1 through 11 to the locusts mentioned in chapter 1? So that's where we can get some confusion too. But the second question is, does the army of chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 comprise locusts or men's and nations? And so there are some that would still say in chapter 2 you've got literal locusts. And there's others that would say, no, this is getting bigger um, in what's going on with the nation of Judah. All right, so that's Chisholm. That's our quiz. And let's open up your notes and keep your course notes out and your Bibles opened to the book of Joel. And let's just begin with the, the question that we always try to use, and that's what did you think of the book having read it? Did you like it? Yes, no, why? Eric, what, what do you want to say? I thought it was actually, I mean, it took a, a lot of time to read it through because it's not so clear. But uh, during the reading, I really got the whole concept of how powerful God is, and that really just struck me out in this book. I mean, it was, like the Lord was like mentioned like 30 times. The Lord's mentioned like five times, God is mentioned eleven times. You really just see that. Again. You got those facts and figures down. Well, you I see, sat there like, so yeah. like after I kept reading, like, oh, this is mentioned a lot, so you start. You know. Yeah, that started just impacting you. The Lord, God, day of the Lord. And so you started noticing that. That's how, that's how those themes really begin to emerge. You get impressed by that. So it was ultimately the power of God that was really yes. what was driving home. Blaze, did you have your hand up? Well, I was just saying, I was just going to say rather frightening, just yeah. the whole description of the army and what it will do. Yeah. It's, it causes me to want to you know, fear the Lord and then at the same time just turn to him more into his grace and such. Yeah, one of the benefits of this class, you know, outside of the fact that this can just be heavy, always thinking about judgment and what the Lord's going to do, one of the benefits is a real sober-mindedness to, wow, my life is really not my own. I belong to the Lord and and he's called me to live a certain way. And if and if we don't live in that way, if we rebel against him, turn our hearts away from him, that can have tragic consequences. And so we're constantly find ourselves reading through these stories and these proclamations that God is giving warnings. He's calling people to live a certain way. And when people turn their back on him, wow, you start reading about this and you say, this is heavy stuff that's going to take place. And in one sense, all these prophets are moving us forward to even, you know, what can be even more bizarre for us to read, which is the book of Revelation. I mean, this ultimate day that is coming when the Lord is going to set the record straight, you know, sit on his throne and claim the sovereignty over the nations that he deserves. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And that's what the Lord is trying to orchestrate along the way. He's trying to turn people's hearts back toward him. Other thoughts? You like the book? Why or why not? Yes? I think I was a little, not like challenged, so I was kind of confused on spots where it was like the Lord like leading an army against like his people. Like it, and like I understood it after a while and seeing that like that's his punishment that leads back to repentance, which leads them back to, back to him. But it took me a little like, all right, God's very blatantly just like, hey, guess what? I'm going to come against you and basically just wipe you guys out and bring you to this point of pretty much decimation. Yeah, and so it, it's, it is decimation, right? Yeah. And that's, that's what you're saying. It's the strong hand yeah. of the Lord. Now, what we need to understand whenever we read this, okay, even when we have this focus on the Lord is going to take severe measures we have to understand, remember, there are big D days of the Lord, and then there's little D day of the Lord's. And so we go back to even Deuteronomy 27, Leviticus 26. The Lord has set this forth for all of his people. I am calling you to obedience. If you obey me, this is how I will bless you. If you do not obey me, then these are the things that are which are going to happen to you. And you even look at passages like Leviticus 26, and it, it will actually create this crescendo if you still do not then, and if you still do not then, and if you still do not then. By the time we get to the prophets, we're not way back here. Okay, this is some little disobedience. I'm trying to correct you. We are at the, if you, have still, if you still do not then, still do not then, still do not then. We're, we're out here now. 
And so the Lord is really working hard. And you know, one day, hopefully you'll know what it's like to be a parent and your child begins to move in a direction and you bring about some discipline and try to bring them back. And then they keep pushing farther and harder and you might make it more severe. And then they keep, you know, and so this whole idea of, no, I'm trying to bring a corrective that's going to help you. Well, we're way down the road now. And so if this is Babylonia, that's the focus here, then the Lord is trying to, in His compassion, in His grace, pull people back so they don't have to experience this because this is going to be a rough road uh, for them. Israel really never recovers from this. And so it's going to take a work of God to move in and actually transform hearts. And that's what Joel begins to talk about. The Spirit's going to come. And this is going to be an amazing day. What Israel has not been able to bring about in their own obedience to the law, the outpouring of the Spirit is going to bring. And that's the day in which we live. And you know, the day is still moving forward um, because we still have the battle with sin. The evil one continues to prowl about. But Joel begins to picture this day, this day that's coming ultimately. Now look at page 53 in your notes. There's very little agreement among scholars as to when Joel prophesies. But one of the questions I have you think about is the main message. And so what do you think is the main message and why? What'd you come up with? Main message of the book. Oh, I don't want that down. That's going to be in my way. Main message. Let me get this out of the way because I'm going to have you back up your thoughts eventually. Main message. Okay, what's the deal here? <laughs> you guys just don't like the book of Joel? Alice, you want to take the lead? Um, I don't know what leading, but I have an answer. You got an answer. Go for it. I mean, So if you were to put a main message into a statement, it would be chapter 2, verse 12. Mm -hmm. You see that really as what captures the heart of the book. So now when you back this up with structure, how did you, what were your major divisions in the book? Um, Okay. One to twenty. Okay. What was the, what was the section? What was this called? Okay. Locusts devour the land while God's people mourn. While God's people mourn. All right, and then section number two. Day of the Lord equals blessing and what? All right. And then number three. Judgment on nations. So you basically have two parts to the day of the Lord here. You've got the blessing part. And then you've got the judgment part that would be there. Okay. All right. Good. Someone else. Main message. And then we're going to back it, back it up a little bit. Who's got one? Marcella, you got a main message? I just put the day of the Lord. That's like my main. It was used like throughout the entire book like five times. Uh-huh. Each chapter. Um, or not even each chapter, but just every like frame of like main frame of thought. So what about your major divisions? What, how'd you divide up the book? Pretty much the same. Um, I guess for the first part, I'll just put like present day of the Lord in a sense. Uh-huh. Uh, and the second part, I put coming. And then the last part, I put like future. Okay, so you've got 
present, coming, and then future. So your focus here is on this little d. Yeah, so I saw day of the Lord. Unity, like the first little d judgment, uh -huh. and that's we he parallels that in the next chapter as, as far as the coming judgment, and obviously the last one is like the big d. You know. Okay, so a lot of connections between how the book is divided up, but when we get to the main message, emphasizing here this day of the Lord, especially the judgment aspect of it, whereas. Uh, with Alice pulling out chapter 2 and verse 12, this idea of return to me with all your heart, which is the focus of why all of this is taking place. Well, what, is the Lord, what is it the Lord wants? Just to tell about judgment? No, he's trying to, to woo the people back into relationship. And so we've got present um, destruction that's taking place and then warning a future destruction. Why? So that the people will come back to the Lord. What is the intent of this? For them to turn their hearts back. What is the intent of their warning? For them to turn their hearts back. Okay. Someone else. Olivia. Oh. Ah. Uh, <laughs> come on. You can do it. What do you have as your main message? I focus more on how God is compassionate and does long to bless them, but is also sending punishment for those who are against him. Okay. So you're pulling both of these together. And you're saying he does long, he wants them to return, but he's also sending judgment, right? And so how did you divide up the book? I did it more by chapters. Okay. Because I felt like the first chapter, kind of like you said, where it's more present and he's calling, the, calling Judah to repent right now. And then where in chapter two and three, God sees it and blesses Judah and then sends punishment. Okay, so you just did chapter one. Chapter 2, and then chapter 3. Olivia, nice job. <laughs> Why were you afraid of that? <laughs> yeah, you're great. It was wonderful. So we really are zeroing in on this theme, both sides of a coin. The one, see, judgment is the focus, and one side of the coin can be the judgment itself. The other side of the coin can be the longing and the compassion of the Lord for his people to return. In other words, the point of the judgment, the fact of the judgment, the point of the judgment. And we see both as we go throughout the book. Now, let me uh, put this up, up here for you, uh, for your notes right there. Um, for the main message, God's judgment for those who do not follow him on the day of the Lord. And so the Lord is going to lay all this out for the people. But there's, there's just very little agreement about when this was written. Very little agreement about exactly where we're going to date this. But when you, when you put that aside, at least the message of the book can be somewhat obvious to us, right? I mean, the message is not that complicated. How we divide it up, we may do a lot of things different. Now, everyone here used three different main, major divisions. Anyone have two or four? You had two. So, Matt, how did you divide it up? Chapter one and then chapter two. Okay, so chapter 1, then chapters 2 and 3. Jeff? I have 4, chapter 1, 1 through 13, chapter 1, 14 through 2, 11, chapter 2, 12 through 29, chapter 2, 3, 21. Okay, so a lot of differences in the way you did that. I'm sure that you can back that up by the way you divided up the, the, the paragraphs and understood those. And so how we divide it up, there could probably be a lot of different things. But when we think about these two aspects, 2.12 and then Day of the Lord, did anyone have a main message that maybe was really different than that or unique from these two aspects? Or is everyone pretty much in this ballpark? Anybody have anything they want to add to the main message? Yes. Um, I have mostly the same idea, except I really noticed Okay, so really pulling up on here, but adding the whole concept of humility as a major part of that. The returning is going to involve this, or this is going to happen. Now, what was that last thing you were saying about the imminent and then future? Yeah, 
Yeah. And so that's how do we understand all of these things becomes the important part. Yes, uh, Brian. Oh, I just had another thing to add. Something Go ahead. Yeah, in Joel, it becomes very clear the Lord will make good on this. They are his people. And so that's why he judges the nations too, right? It's because of what they've done to his people. But then he's going to make sure, he's going to make sure that something happens with his people. He's going to restore and pour out blessing on them. Well, let's look at a few things that we have in your notes here. You see the prophet Joel. We know nothing of Joel apart from this book. So we have no real background. It would be nice if we could see Joel mentioned somewhere in 2 Kings, Ezra, Nehemiah. We just don't have a mention of him. His name actually means Yahweh is God. And that's, that's about all we have is his name and what it means and that he prophesies. Um, but look at the introductory comments. The book is undated. And there's no kind of chronology given. And so in some books we're going to see it came about in this king or like in the book of Haggai and Zechariah. You actually have dates that are given throughout the book. Here we have nothing. So Joel prophesies as early as the reign of Joash, putting it all the way back in 2 Kings 11 and 2 Chronicles 22, in the years 830 to 800. That's what some would say. That's that early pre-exilic, or as late as the first return from the Babylonian captivity. And so that would be in 515 to 500, Ezra 5, 6 would be the idea. Now in your notes here, what I do is I provide just some explanation. And Chisholm does the same thing. Every commentary is going to walk into this and say, these are the reasons for, these are the reasons against. And you'll find yourself reading each view going, oh, that sounds good. Those are good reasons. And then you'll say objections. Oh, those sound really good. I, I can understand that. And so it can be very difficult. But you've got the earlier date is supported by the following. And again, it's that whole thing of the arrangement of the 12 is, is where a lot of people begin. Um, but there are some references to various passages in there. Then the later date is supported by a number of different issues. And you have five that are written down there. And I would like to add a couple more to that um, reasons for the, the later date. So you see one, two, three, four, five. And number six would be this right here. And that is that the temple, play, the temple, temple is viewed positively in the book. We don't have much of a reference to it, but the temple is viewed positively. We don't see Joel um, rebuking idolatry. We don't see him, you know, talking about the abuses of religion. None of those kind of things. So the only reference we have to temple is, is positive. There doesn't seem to be any kind of syncretism. Remember Hosea and Amos? I mean, they're just pounding on this, especially Hosea. But not, it's not true in Joel. And then number seven, we see in chapter three, in verse 19, it says, Egypt will become a waste and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah. Well, that's an interesting verse right there. And so by looking at 319, the anger expressed toward Edom in that verse um, could be best explained by their treatment of Judah in the Babylonian conquest. Okay, so the anger expressed toward Edom could possibly be best explained by their treatment of Judah at the Babylonian conquest. And so what scholars would do is look at that historically and look at the role of Edom in, in the midst of that. So Babylon comes down in 586. He destroys the, they destroy the temple and all that takes place. That could be that great army. And so Edom in 319 could be best explained by what happens at the Babylonian conquest. But look at the, the, the point I make at the top of page 54. The final conclusion, it's speculative or inferential at best, and there's going to be even more discussion of this below. 
uh, for us there. And that's, that's a problem for this book. We, we really want to know where this book fits historically so we can understand what the Lord's prophesying and that makes it difficult. Now look at point B. Regardless of confusion over dating, the situation has more clarity. So even though you step back and try to figure out, okay, where does, where, where, how do we date this book? And you read Chisholm discussion, how do you date this? And you look at the notes here, how do you date this? When you get into the book, I don't think the situation is that unclear. Now again, is, this, is the locusts, are they armies, or what's going on? But, but the situation is more clear. The nation is in the midst of a devastating locust plague. When you look at chapter 1, verse 4, you can see that really clear. Chapter 1, verse 4, what the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten, what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten, what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. And so commentaries will get into all that and even bring that, bring warfare into that and make it an army. So there's a lot of discussion about that. But there's also a perilous drought and an imminent military invasion. So if you stick with what Chisholm says, and basically the way I understand the book, you've got a, you've got a terrible locust crisis, you've got a drought, and you've got a, an army that's coming. So that situation all seems to be clear. These are each signs of the curses of the covenant. Again, going back to Deuteronomy 27 and 28, Leviticus 26, you can see that there. Now point C, the unity of the book has been questioned. Now this is a point that will almost be brought up with every single prophet. And you just, it's just, a major point of discussion. I don't spend a lot of time with it because I accept the Bible as we have it, but it doesn't mean that there's not good issues that are being raised. So in this particular book, it's questioned. It's difficult to find a strong argument for disunity. A single theme clearly unites the book. The present terrible locust plague, okay, that's now, is a forerunner of awful things to come. The plague, the drought, little d-day the Lord is here, the invasion, the big D day of the Lord is near. And so you've got this present situation, little d, with a future situation, a big D, and that seems to bring a lot of unity. Now, I don't deal here with what people raise as reasons or issues for disunity, but you can find plenty of situation, uh, argument like that out there in various um, commentaries but not really in the evangelical conservative world. They're not really dealing with this issue because there seems to be such a flow. Or I, at least I think so. I mean, what did you find in reading the book? Did you find yourself all of a sudden going, Urgh! well, how did we get over here? I mean, what just happened? Or did it seem like it flowed fairly well? Whether you could understand it or not, did it seem like it flowed well? What do you think? Riley? Okay, so you feel like there could be disunity in the book? Um, could be, that's not the question I raised, though, my concern. Uh, my concern was much more with, um, like, it, it went down to, we said, like, never again will my people be shamed. And how historically, we, if you take that literally, that's not at all what happened. They were shamed yeah. for the next 3,000 years. Um, mine was, it's so disjointed and it requires <clears throat> so much knowledge of literary context and Jewish, how to read Jewish literature stuff. Um, how could the average Christian ever read this correctly? Yeah. Um, and then the question brought up, okay, well then, how right was basically the Catholic Church for the longest time hiding the scripture or like not allowing just the average Christian to read the scriptures? Like they don't have the knowledge or time to really be able to read it correctly. Yeah, well, were you able to pull together some kind of outline in the book yourself, put yeah, together a structure? I, yeah, that, that's after, that's while using two commentaries and three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, a peasant, and a peasant in Germany in the 1800s doesn't really have that. So, yeah, well, yeah. Um, that was what I brought up. That was just my own thoughts on it, is while wow, this book is difficult, if I was a pastor, if I was like witnessing the Reformation, I'd be like, well, what would you do about the book of Joel? You can't get back to them. Like, don't, don't mess that up. Yeah, it'd be tough. And when I, when I teach the way I teach here, and it can be a daunting task. I mean, some people come in and they say, I'm, I just became a Christian. 
I mean, I, I don't have you know Christian school in my background like everybody else that I see sitting around me. I'm really afraid to do these worksheets and, and really try to come up with my own work and understand these books. And I find you really can. It is a daunting task. Now, that doesn't mean at the end of the day that you understand everything about a book, but little by little we grow and we understand. And so imagine a brand new Christian, you know, trying to outline Joel and trying to understand it. It's going to raise a lot of questions, right? And so that's why one of your question is, what questions do you have about the book? Because we're never done studying a book. We're always growing. And so imagine that person reading through the book of Joel and then one day finally making it to the book of Acts and going, whoa, there, there's something going on here. And so what happens? Well, that person now is pulling things together even more. And so it does take a lot of time. And some of these books, viewpoints on them will never be definitive. So the further we get away from the message, the more difficult it is. But this is what the Lord has given us. And I really do be believe that although there can be a lot of confusion when you get to the end of the book, we continue to learn and grow. Now, we have a lot of resources in America. I and mean, that's one of the points Riley is making. We have a ton of resources. When I travel overseas, I love to get together with pastors. And one of the questions I always like to ask them is, can I see your library? And it's amazing. I mean, you buy more books in one semester for your Bible classes than some of these pastors have in their libraries. And when you look at the books, it's you know usually Rick Warren's um, what's his big book? Purpose. Purpose Driven Life. You know, usually that's the book that was translated in their language. Now, God bless Rick Warren, and that's wonderful that those books are out there, but that's not going to help this guy with the book of Joel, is it? I mean, it's just not going to help him, but those are the books that get translated in other languages, and they just don't have a lot of resources. But then I start talking to them about, well, how are you doing with preaching? And they long for more resources, but they also know that they're simply taking what they can understand and what they can get, and they're feeding their flock. They're just passing it on. And through a lifetime of study, you will grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But at some point in time, we have hindrances when we don't know Hebrew when we don't understand the Bible enough to make connections, or we continue to lose sight of any kind of backgrounds. It really is difficult. Yes? I just point out that there are two things. One, there's a lot of redundancy built into the Bible, so um, a book like Joel may be difficult to necessarily understand in detail, but um, even if we didn't have the book of Joel, there's nothing lost, because there, the messages and themes in Joel are repeated elsewhere. Um, in, parts of the Bible that are easier to understand. Yeah. In fact, the prophets, I mean, one of the reasons one, the way, one of the reasons I teach Old Testament history and literature the way I do, rather than go through each of the prophetic books, I just try to give the sense of it, right? Because the prophets keep on going at the same issues over and over and over. Maybe it's this nation, maybe it's Judah, maybe it's Israel, but it's all the same thing. It's a formula that's working. People have walked away from the Lord. The Lord is calling them back. But especially, you know, when you get into the prophetic literature, it really can be difficult stuff. And so we've got to become lifetime, lifetime learners of the Word of God and just keep on building. And in some sense, you know, when I teach minor prophets, I continue to go through these books and continue to learn, even from you. I mean, I learn a lot of stuff from students' insights into what they bring out in the text, and I'm grateful for that. I mean, we, we just keep on trying to learn back and forth because of all the difficulties that are there. So, the unity of the book's question, I think this day of the Lord theme is what pulls it all together. Now, point number D brings, or point big D there, brings out more issues about the literal or figural, figurative meaning of locusts. My own conclusion I have here would be that chapter 1, the locusts are literal, actual locusts, whereas in chapter 2 they are figurative. The locusts are used in a figurative sense as a reference to armies. In a number of different passages you can see uh, throughout the Bible, this is just something that's been used there. Uh, Joel's use of both the figurative and the literal keeps the message focused on its ultimate point. God is calling His people back to a committed relationship with Him by judging them with difficulty to get their attention. 
So the issue is not the what specifics of the judgment, but the who specifics of the relationship between the nation and the Lord. That's why I love this 212 focus here is because it really brings that relational issue home. And I think that's a good way to say it. I haven't thought of that before. Along with the fact that this prophecy is tied tightly to a historical situation, this intentional ambiguity makes the prophecy timeless in nature. Okay, so it's very clear there's something specific going on here, but we can't anchor it. And that brings out this stronger sense of the timeless nature of the prophecy itself. The nation can fill in the blanks at any point in her history. And that's what I think is true of prophetic literature as a whole. It's just a constant message over and over. And Joel really brings that home. Fill in the blanks. What is the Lord doing now? Something's about to come. You've got to return to him. Again, chapter 2, verse 12, drawing that home. It points to the simplicity of the message of the prophets, the Old Testament, and the Bible. God wants people of all nations in all time to know who he is and to live in light of this knowledge. Okay, so we've got this sense that... Um, God is moving and God wants something to happen in his people. We just can't figure out where it fits historically, even though it's obvious it fits somewhere very tightly. Now, there's a number of things that we could say about all that, but look at the background issues on the next page. Um, again, just trying to get into, and this is what I said we would talk about this more further down. The specific situation is going to depend on the date of the book, and we have a difficulty with that. We've got the earlier date, the later date. Remember, Chisholm talks about the earlier pre-exilic, the later pre-exilic. But what I try to do here with point B, if it's earlier, then here's an assessment. When investigating the background during this time period, it seems less probable, now this is just my opinion, that the details of Joel fit this situation since this is a positive time in Judah's history. Um, then point C talks about the later date, if it's later, and then I give an assessment there. When investigating the background during this time period, it seems more probable that the details of Joel could fit this situation since the Lord is continuing his work of getting the attention of the people as they struggle to follow him. Now, I go back and forth on this, though, because there's, I already erased it, but there's a part of me, that great army being Babylon, the presence of the house of the Lord there. I mean, it's just, it's so much difficulty to try to land there. But I just try to lay some of that out for you. On page 56, I talk a little bit about the, the structure of the book. It can be difficult to outline. Um, you had a lot of agreement in this class on what to do. Um, it would be really interesting to, to debate exactly why we divide it up the way we do, because I know you've thought about it and you've tried to put together a structure that makes sense to you. Um, but this becomes an important part of understanding the book. When it's difficult to date a book, the way you structure it can really help um, as much as possible. So there, hopefully we can find a flow to it. What I do in point B is give the outline from the expositor's Bible commentary. Notice he simply does the present instructions based on the locust plague, so the first, most of the first two chapters, and then God's future intentions, the eschatological program. That's a nice way to do it. Okay, here's present. This is you, Israel. All right, now this is bigger picture of what God is going to do. Another option to note the similarities in distinguishing the major sections. And so this particular book, the two big pictures are the present situation and God's future intentions, but then there's different pericopes. Pericopes is simply a passage, a unified passage of Scripture, um, but the author here sees four different pericopes, three with the present situation, and then this fourth into the future. Now, on the top of the next page is where I give an outline um, that's been helpful to me. Again, this is when I just sat down on a research leave or sabbatical, whatever it was, and just dove into all these books. You've got three sections here, the judgment to Judah going up through chapter 217, then the immediate deliverance to Judah in 218 to 32. This becomes a you know, really important time uh, for the nation. And then we've got the ultimate deliverance to Judah. And this is what I call an expansion of what was going on in 228 to 32. In other words, this immediate situation, deliverance that takes place, is, is really going to be expanded in something bigger. And Joel really does um, give this as a 
all at one time kind of picture. But when we get to the New Testament, we begin to realize, okay, this was expansive. Um, this really was something bigger that took place. And so you've got the Lord judging the nations and then the Lord blessing Judah. He is going to bring this about. Now, when we get to the overall message, there's a couple of things that we could say here. Um, the overall message of the book, this is the situation. This is the situation. Let me put this down so we can see this better. And this situation is in point is not going to be different than what we've seen with other books. But when we bring it to bear upon the book of Joel, the situation, God's blessing on the nation brought forgetting. So they've been in a good time period, but somehow Israel's forgetting. That's a major issue throughout Israel's life, and it can be a major issue in our life, our, our life as well. God's blessing leads to forgetting. Faith became formalism and morality deteriorated. The Lord wants to be known for who He is and as a result to be worshipped with the worship that He deserves. And so He longs for that. In chapter 2, in verse 27, um, Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God. There is no other and my people will never be put to shame. The Lord is who He is and He wants to be known. In chapter 3, verse 17, Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. So Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. And so in both situations, the Lord says, I am the Lord. And then He pronounces that He's going to be faithful to His people as well because he's in a covenant relationship with them. So he's going to be worshiped the way he deserves, but also we see that hanging. He's going to bring something about in his people. So the point then, the locust plague destroyed the crops and has brought down the economy. Okay, so what, what's one of the best ways to get people's attention? It's financial. And so the Lord does that with Israel, gets their attention. However, it is only a warning of what is to come if Israel does not return. And again, so the centrality of chapter 2, verse 12, return to me, becomes so important. There will be a worse judgment in the future if the people do not return to Yahweh. Now, this pattern right here is, again, like we've already mentioned, something that we see throughout the prophets. And this is something that we probably could see in our life if we had commentary on it. The ones that the Lord loves, He disciplines. And so how would the Lord do this in our life is something interesting for us to think about. Again, all we're looking at here is little D-Day the Lord's, big D-Day the Lord's, um, the way the Lord works in our life. The bottom line is He wants our attention. The question is, what is it going to take? And so the Lord begins with the economy. You're going to feel it here. Haggai says the same thing. You keep hoarding for yourself and it's going into pockets with holes. Why? I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to get your attention. So the same thing's happening here. And a locust plague would devastate that place and hopefully get their attention. If not, then something else is going to have to happen because the Lord wants relationship with His people. And again, the amazing thing about the Old Testament is, again, thinking about those two verses, the Lord wants relationship with His people. They rebel, they rebel, they rebel, they rebel, they walk away, walk away, walk away. And so what does the Lord do? He moves in and He changes their hearts and brings them back to Himself. And that's partly what Joel is talking about here, this outpouring of the Spirit that's going to be the beginning of that where God is going to now transform the heart in amazing ways. And so Deuteronomy 8, when you think about God's blessing on the nation leads to forgetting, Deuteronomy 8 is the huge passage on that. It's just one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. When you get in the land and you live in houses you did not build and you eat from food you did not plant, don't you forget. Don't you get raised up in your heart thinking, hey, look what I did, look what I accomplished. I'm the one that brought you here. And so the Lord wants to be acknowledged as the Lord. Now, continuing the message of Joel, bottom of page 57, there is a historical day of the Lord. And then on page 58, you see the final day of the Lord. And so historically, God does something, but then this final ultimate sense, um, look at page 58, look at the final day of the Lord. 
it says point number one, note, and afterward or after this. In other words, it's still future to the writer and to us even now when we understand history, some of this. And the focus is that all nations will receive their judgment. Certain events are to happen previous to the arrival of this ultimate event. So here's where we get into Acts. So it will come about after this, chapter 2, verse 28. This is Peter's sermon in Acts 2, 16 to 21, where he refers to the teaching in Joel 2, points to the partial fulfillment of these events. Now, Peter's going to quote the whole thing. He's going to lay it all out there and say, this is what was prophesied by Joel. Um, so this reference puts Joel 2, 2, 2, 28 and 29 in the period of Pentecost as this day fulfills the prophecy of God's Spirit being poured out, evidenced by prophesying. So that's what happens in the day of Pentecost. Now notice it says, since the prophecy of Joel 2, 30 to 31, does not find clear fulfillment in chapter 2. Jeff, could you read 30 and 31 for us of Joel chapter 2? I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so when we look at Pentecost, we don't see that happen. We see 2, 28 and 29 happening, but we don't see 2, 30 and 31 happening there. But Matthew 24, look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24, so we've got the words of Jesus here. In 29... Michaeline, could you read Matthew 24, 29 to 31? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels in a loud trumpet call. And they, will gather his, and they will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. So when we read Jesus' words there, that's much more like what we see here in Joel chapter 2, verses 30 and 31. So you see in your notes there, this passage teaching about the Lord's return seems to indicate that the events have something to do with the tribulation that could be taking place. So this is where we really see clearly this prophetic sense. Okay, the prophet is standing here and we've got these events like this. Okay, and so he's addressing this situation right here, that immediate situation. But without thinking about our four events here, I mean, look, about, look at how Clearly, he's looking at this Holy Spirit outpouring, but also there's this return of the Lord, day of tribulation that's there as well. And so the question always is, what did the prophet understand about all of this? So we get to Acts 2. And we go, oh, okay. And then we see Jesus is teaching in Matthew 24. And we go, oh, okay. There's something going on here. What did the prophet understand? Okay, the fantastic language, the cataclysmic language is trying to get a response. Chapter 2, verse 12 in the people. And so this is where it's simply by reading through Scripture and trying to understand what's going on. But in the prophet's eyes, how does the prophet present his message? Bam! I mean, just right there. It's one big picture. And then how does Joel even take Joel? All right, here it is. This is happening. But we understand there's even more. And so that's why this church age is oftentimes really a parenthesis in the way people understand things. I mean, the, the, the apostles never thought, never even imagined that the church age would last this long. <laughs> I mean, there's no way. When you, when you get back in books like Daniel, um, and, it, and it talks about some of these prophetic events, the church age just has to be squeezed in there. And that's the amazing work of God taking the message to the Gentiles. I mean, the, the Old Testament talks about it, but never was it envisioned to be this full-blown 
where people groups are being rich, um, reached and scriptures are being translated into other languages. And people are sacrificing their lives to go overseas so that people can understand the message. I mean, this is amazing um, the way this plan is unfolding. Joel, I don't think even could have imagined the church age fitting in here like this. And God paying such close attention to the Gentiles because what was his focus? Jews, 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 Israel, Judah. I mean, that's the focus there. This understanding of the church age. And as we represent the nations of the world in here, we ought to sit back and go, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. We're brought in. Those of us who were far off are brought near. Okay, we're brought in to this whole thing. It's just amazing to think about all of that. And the prophets, I don't think, really have too much thought of that. The Old Testament doesn't. Okay? Um, just thinking about the book, just stepping back because we're running out of time. You can see you've got other pages of notes talking about the two stages of the day, the key theological themes in Joel. But what were some of the major, prof, um, major topics that you were really impressed with as you went through this book? Just some major topics. What would you come up with? Eric was mentioning earlier just the references of the name of God, the Lord, day of the Lord. Was that one of your major topics to really point out the... Right, I had like a like God <coughs> power and I just had like subtopics like over nature, people, the earth. Okay. Prophecy. And you can see in your notes, um, in your course notes, it's very theocentric, <laughs> this book is. I mean, it's God. He's at work. He's the one that locusts. He's the army. He's the restoration. He's the judgment to the nation. He's the blessing Israel. And so it's very focused on him. Other major topics. What did you come up with? Yes? I saw God's kindness come out a lot, especially when, when it has that, that, that turn point at 218. Um, when it says the Lord is jealous for his land and took pity on his people. And like, all of a sudden you just see God like, just like bringing back uh, a repentant Judah and just saying, like, So how many references did you underscore for that compassion? I think I had at least like 12 or so. Yeah. And so here in the midst of this book, little d judgment, locust plague, all this taking place, big D, this coming army, judgment to the nation, there's, there's compassion in this book. I mean, even in the judgment aspect, I want you to see the grace and mercy of the Lord. The point always is turning the hearts of people back to the Lord. Same way a parent disciplines a child, turn their heart back so they get back into the circle of blessing. That's what the Lord is seeking to do with his people. So continue to try to find those themes of the Lord's compassion here. And it will really will amaze you. You'll, you'll say, wow, it really is all over the place. God sneaks it in. Any other major topics? Yes. Um, for me, I put that the law shall be first. I notice a lot of mm -hmm. just like God just breaking down like anything that was considered shame to the world, honor and honor to shame. Yeah. So God does that a lot in Scripture, doesn't He? He just reverses things in a way that surprises us. Well, how'd you end up applying the book to your life? Well, how did God really impact you? I mean, Eric was mentioning earlier about this, um, the impact of the Lord and God and just, just his, his power in the midst of all this. And that can lead to worship and a sobriety and a humility in our lives. But what else did you do? How did you apply the book? Yes? Um, one of the themes that I noticed was how it talks a lot about how Israel, or Judah won't be shamed in front of the nations and just how Judah was meant to represent God to the nations, um, which is a really big, I mean, we have the same responsibility and it's really, it really could be a burden, I guess. Um, and it should be in one sense, but on the other hand, <clears throat> it's also God's responsibility to make to make us good representatives. In yeah. That sense. So um, we need God to do that. Right. And, yes. And in this book, I saw that um, he he promises Judah that he will be known as their God, and he will not let them be ashamed. Yeah. Another way to say that is God calls us to be a light, but it's He's the one who makes us. 
a light at the same time. And that's why, I mean, Paul constantly says, I boast in nothing else except the cross, except the Lord. He's the one who does this. And so it's for by grace you're even saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, there's nothing that we have to boast in in the end. But yet we still have a responsibility. And so God's people had a responsibility, but it's the Lord who does all this. And, and again, when you look at the big picture here, Israel never gets their act together throughout their history. It's God who steps in and transforms. He's the one that brings about what He desires in His people in the end. All praise be to God is where that ends up. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.